Welcome to Inspiring Teachers, a show bringing you classroom tips, motivation, and stories from successful educators. Join Tavis Bean and Danny Hogger as they explore the why of teaching. Oh, welcome into Danny Hogger Podcast and Inspiring Teachers on a beautiful Wednesday in the middle of staying at home and you know trying to make the best of this whole time period with my family, friends, making music and making lessons for everybody around the world. And today we have a real treat. Steve Fiziok, the best when we come back in broadcasting, has been the play-by-play voice of professional sports for decades, uniquely describing the action and drama of live events with a captivating and friendly tone. I had the chance to work with him for about five years at KLAA down in Anaheim, and he is one of the best in the business at making it an art form in sports broadcast. Joining us, connecting with his personality, Steve Fiziok. But uh, you weren't a particularly exceptional student. And then um, I know later on, you had a few mentors that helped you along the way. What, um, and you talked about too, in another interview I listened to, having shaking hands and knowing that this is what you always wanted to do. So tell me, like, once you decided that, what kind of things motivated you and how did you keep the resolve to get what you wanted? Well, I was never afraid of failure. I think I talked about that earlier. And I had a great professor, Bob Fiddler at Kansas State, and he recognized not my grades, but my enthusiasm, my passion. So it seemed like every time a job came up, whether it was $5 to do a ball game for St. Xavier in high school in Junction City, Kansas, that barely paid for my drive over there. But still, it was experience. And I want to encourage students to go, What you're doing now is you're building your resume. So say yes to everything, every internship, even though it's not in your field. I mean, I did not only sports, but I did news. I was a disc jockey. I did the anniversary couple of the week show at KHAS in Hastings, Nebraska. I did party line. I did kitchen clatter. I did, but I just figured anything I could do to get my face and my voice in front of a microphone or a camera would be you know, success, because all I wanted was repetition to continue to do ball games. And uh, for 45 years now, I've done football, basketball, and baseball. I cut out football a few years ago, like I said, because I wanted to spend more time with my, my grandchildren. But I still do 180 baseball games a year, and I still do a handful of basketball games. But I, I'm, I'm pretty much a one-sport guy now. <laughs> uh, in the early years when you were getting all that experience you had to move a lot I mean you you jumped around as many broadcasters do it's common but you had Warriors Grizzlies LA Rams football and then traveled a lot for television what are your memories of kind of the whirlwind time before you would settle in and, and I don't mean to say that baseball is not a whirlwind you're on the road all the time but uh, in the years where there was less certainty uh, what are your memories from that time period well it goes back to fear the one thing I was talking about, and I think most people regret things that they didn't do rather than mistakes that they made along the way. And my mom told me one time that the two most important decisions you'll make in your life are what do you want to be when you grow up and who do you want to spend your, the rest of your life with? Mm -hmm. And all I can tell you, Danny, is I've hit grand slam home runs on both. (laughs) And I say that because I was in a situation when I was doing the Cincinnati Reds and we went from third in the rankings, ratings, to number one. And I was also the sportscaster. Well, the general manager didn't want me to do baseball anymore. He just wanted, so he basically offered me only one job. And I went home and I was devastated because I wanted to do play-by-play. I really wasn't interested in being a sportscaster. That was a means to an end. And I went home and my wife, we had Uh, recently married. We had just adopted our first child. And that child was only one month old at the time. And I'm thinking, hey, I'm a husband. I'm a father. I've got to be responsible. And my wife's answer to me, because we had this six-figure offer to be a sportscaster in Cincinnati, or I'm gone. And I did have a uh, friend who showed my work to a friend in San Francisco and said, this kid's pretty talented. Uh, You might want to give him a look. And he said, if he comes out here, I'll give him work one day a week. Well, my wife told me, she said, we have to, uh, we have got to leave. What do you want to do? And I said, I want to do play by play. And she, and she said, then that's what we have to do because I don't want to live with a husband who's unhappy. And I just said, you are the, you know, the greatest. We actually went out there and 
quite frankly, it was a rare let go, let God moment where I completely let go of, of stuff. We went out there on the back of uh, my brother's produce truck who drove us out there, our, our furniture out there for free. And I got work one day a week at KTVU. And then I got vacation relief at KGO radio. Now, everything fell into place. That doesn't mean I didn't hustle. I did hustle. I was going into work even when I wasn't getting paid because I just wanted to put together the best show I could when I was working. Well, obviously, I made an impression. And within three months, I was not only working full time, but the San Francisco Giants, KTVU, had put me on with their broadcast in 1987, the year they won the National League West. Mm -hmm. Well, that all resulted in... Um, doing football and basketball for Fresno State, uh, San Francisco Giants, which later led to the Golden State Warriors, which later led to ESPN and then Fox. And so I think the whole key is not being afraid and, and, and not being afraid of failure. Yeah. And uh, when you put, put yourself out there, it's amazing how things come back to you per perfectly. It really is. And it's probably a testament to your work ethic and the way you carried yourself too, that people remembered the way that they enjoyed working with you and that good reputation starts to build. I've told students similar messages where you can do anything you want. It's only going to be you that decides that you can't. And whenever that occurs, it's very tough to curl around that because you can set your limits and um, set your potentials. So I really appreciate that message a lot. Um, when I last worked with you, the five years I was at KLAA with the Angels was part of your 13-year run there. What are some of the, the happy factors and joys you take from your time in L.A. and time with the Angels? Well, we had 10 years in Northern California and 16 in Southern California. And just um, everyone we met was fantastic. And I was just very, very grateful for the opportunity because I think I'll t I told you earlier, I would have been just as happy. Uh, doing games in Boise, Idaho, as I was in Southern California. My path led me to Southern California. I was very, very grateful for the 14 years I had doing Angels baseball on both radio and, and television. And um, it, it was an exciting time. We had a chance to watch uh, a team that was a ne'er-do-well team become a, a, a world champion under Bill Stoneman and Mike Sosha's leadership, and they won it in 2002, and that was remarkable to see. And then when Rex Hudler and I left and came to Kansas City, and Kansas City is my hometown, so I was basically coming home. We came here in 2012, and I called Rex and I said, I'm not sure if you looked at their minor league system. <laughs> we might be getting there at the right time. Yeah, and turned out. We, we did, and, and uh, we did games in 12 and 13, but you could see the slow growth and it was much like the Angels in 99, 2000, 2001, which led to 2002 and a world championship. 12, 13, and led to World Series in 14 and 15. And the Royals, of course, won in 15. And now they're trying to do it again. But I have nothing but great memories of my time in Southern California. The opportunities I received from both ESPN and from Fox. And with Fox, I was doing college football and college basketball. I was the voice of the then Pac-10 network. Now it's the uh, Pac-12 adding Utah and Colorado. But I did football and basketball. And then I did Angels baseball. And Fox asked me to do their national baseball games as well. So I did those on Thursday nights and sometimes on, on Saturday afternoon. So it was a wonderful time. And now here I am at the age of 65, really at the end of my career. And once again, I look back and I go, I'm so grateful for that opportunity to come home and broadcast the team that I loved growing up in the Kansas City Royals and being part of their world championship in 2015. So it's been a wonderful life. It's, it's a really beautiful story, the, the full circle nature of it, the, the ability to train and gain confidence somewhere and be able to return and find success while the team's also finding success. You, you've given me a lot to talk about in that last piece there. I produced Rex Hudler's Wonder Hour for a year, and he uh -huh. is one of the – I tell people that – I've never or rarely met people who are truly a cartoon or so animated and are the same in real life as they are broadcast to such a genuine guy. Um, is it true you also worked with Jerry Springer coming up? Yes, I did in Cincinnati. And he still to this day is one of the smartest, funniest people I've ever been around. And that's one of the reasons um, we went from third place in the ratings to number one was because Jerry Springer was our lead anchor. I was the sports anchor. He mm -hmm. was the news anchor. 
Pat Berry did the weather. Norma Rashid was uh, the uh, co-anchor. And we went from third to first. And uh, obviously, it presented wonderful opportunities. But sometimes opportunities can mean you, you, you get cut. And in this case, they said, we only want you to be a sportscaster. We don't want you to do play-by-play. -play. And that was the exact opposite of what I wanted. And that's what led me to San Francisco. Wow, it's, it's really interesting the way things transpire. What was it like and what is it like working with HUD every day, who is just such a ball of energy at going every direction in every place? Well, he only lives like a mile away from us, which is fantastic. And we're dear friends with both Rex and Jennifer Hudler and, and their kids. And he is that way. We, we carpool to work together quite often. That's what we do when we go to the airport to, to fly with the team. But all I can tell you in the almost 30 years that we've known each other, Danny, you know him well. He is always the same. And I know there are some people who think he is a cartoon figure, but he has this saying that his mom gave him, be a fountain, not a drain. And he is a fountain that overflows all the time. And I just love him. I love his kindness. I have seen uh, his demonstration of charity through his Team Up for Down Syndrome program. And uh, he's just one of those people. And, and, and believe me when I say this, when we go to work, we always want to be surrounded by people who are in a good mood and smiling and fun. And that's Rex Hudler. Every single day I've gone to work with that guy has been nothing but joy, nothing but fun. And he's self-deprecating. -de he he uh, knows the game, but he's, he's just fun to work with. It's, it's such a, a joy. I've used that word a few times today, but I think it resonates that you do want to be around. I mean, this is what you're going to be doing for, the, for most of your day. I tell my students all the time that uh, you really want to enjoy and look forward to the next day. You don't want to be going to bed dreading what's coming. You want to be happy. And so I run my classroom very happy, which can be tricky going into history when we have to talk about war and destruction so often. But I always try to find that silver lining that's going to keep them positive or at least be positive about how they're going to approach the rest of their day. Something I heard you say in a different interview were, was when you uh, would find a child in the crowd and you'd say, oh, you could see yourself in that child. And I find the same thing in my students or when I broadcast for Stanford or Cal State Fullerton. Uh, and I, I also learned from Melba Beals, one of my teachers at Dominican, who was one of the Little Rock Nine in Central Arkansas, who said, Danny, you want each broadcast to be a gift. So I think about that as each class. Um, you know, what gift can I give them? I wonder, besides just the broadcasting that you do, when people hear a Steve Biziok broadcast or a, a season of it, what do you hope that they're walking away from besides just the events on the field? Well, hopefully they'll enjoy the experience. And I'll, I'll give you a little story that my mom told me. And it has a little something to do with uh, today, what we're going through with this coronavirus. Okay. And like 30 years ago, I was talking to my mom and I was kind of like downgrading my profession because when you think about it, Danny, look at what I do. I tell stories about guys who hold wooden sticks and try and hit a round ball away from guys with leather gloves. Yeah, yeah. It's a silly job. So I was telling that to my mom and she goes, she got angry with me. Mm -hmm. she goes, Steve. I'm from New York City. I went through the Depression, and I went through World War II. Yeah. And all I can tell you is Yankee Stadium, Ebbets Field, and the Polo Grounds were filled because people needed somewhere to go to get away from the misery that was taking place in their life. And from that point on, I looked at my job a little differently. I've always loved my job. I've always loved play-by-play. -play, but I thought, there might be somebody out there who's having a lousy day. And perhaps for three hours, they can escape that misery, whatever is taking place in their life, a loss of a loved one, a divorce, um, a, you know, a destructive child, whatever it might be, perhaps they can get away by listening to baseball. And I want to bring it, and I want to bring it in an exciting way, in a passionate way, in a friendly way. Um, I, I don't want to be a downer. That's one of the reasons I like working with Rex. Rex yeah. is always up. He sees the game with a kid's eyes mm -hmm. and the joy. And obviously, you're going to lose games. The Royals have lost over 100 games in back-to-back -back seasons. But what we saw was a team fighting to come together, and that gave me hope. And that's the same thing I want to get across to the listeners, that we watch sports for hope. And I really think that baseball can be part of our healing once we come back, and I hope it Hopefully, we'll be coming back very soon because I think people need um, somewhere to go, somewhere to watch. I mean, as an example, 
the NFL draft has never had as many viewers as they had because people were hungry for sports and it gives us hope. Yeah, you know, it gives us hope and it gives us togetherness and things. That is a wonderful story. Um, I remember a similar feeling when I was at the Angels and I had to make a decision between family and working three part-time jobs. And when a contract came that was out of broadcast and I took it, but I eventually did circle around to it as a hobby again and teaching as a way to get a message to students that hopefully creates hope and a brighter future of students who have a head on their shoulders that want to see a unity and togetherness. I think that's what baseball gives us too. It's a conversation and a focus that can take our minds off. It can be an escape, but it can also be something that we celebrate life, you know, and vitality and athleticism and enjoyment. And that's a a wonderful thing. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple questions because some of my students are interested in writing and you wrote Walls of Luca in 2006, over 200 reviews, really well um, acclaimed. And I I took a look at it last night for a few hours and was reading. And I know that you're a fan of history as well, uh, clearly with the way that you've written it. What prompted that in you? And and was that something you thought about for a while? You know, I think um, books and baseball are rather similar. They're both quiet and enjoyable. I mean, nothing will happen for 20 minutes in a baseball game. Then all of a sudden there'll be electricity. And sometimes when I'm reading, I'll just be immersed in that that, that moment, that scene. But uh, the story is my wife and I were vacationing in Italy in 2006, and I actually had a vivid dream of a great walled city and two families struggling to produce this wine. Well, instead of going back to bed, I got up I wrote down the story, the outline, told my wife about it and the next day she said, well, that's pretty cool. And then we toured uh, Florence and Venice and did that thing. And a week later we were driving into this town of Lucca, Italy. And I'm going, oh my gosh, Stacy, this is it. This is the city that was in my dream, the Great Walls. And now I'm interested. So I got a book of the history of the walls of Lucca, fascinated by that. And I just started writing it. And it took me over 10 years to complete and I finally uh, put it out there in 2018. And obviously, Danny the fears about that. I'm thinking, yeah. this isn't very good. I sent it to like 60 different agents, um, rejected by all 60. But there were some people in New York that believed in the book. And they said, get it to reviewers. So I got it to reviewers. The reviewers were good. And then all of a sudden, we started winning awards like the Reader Views Literary Awards for Best of Historical Fiction, which totally shocked me. Well, that helped build the sales. We've had over 150,000 sales in two years, or downloads, I should say, because sometimes they're book sales or ebook sales or Amazon Prime sales, but you can only get it on Amazon. And if you Googled my name or Googled the walls of, of Luca, it would show up. But it's been extremely rewarding. But I think as a storyteller for 45 years, I've always been drawn to great storytellers, whether it's Ben Scully or Jack Buck in baseball or James Michener or uh, John Steinbeck or Diana Gabaldon in, in, in writing, I was fascinated about someone's ability to craft a good story. And I, I wanted to challenge myself and see if I could do that. And, and I knew I might, I, I totally expected Danny to have people go, don't quit your day job, you stink. <laughs> yeah. Instead, it's been the reverse. Totally. So I wrote not only The Walls of Luca, but the sequel Same Above thing. the Walls. Both have been honored for Best Historical Fiction in 18 and 19 by uh, two literary uh, awards. And then I just started writing my third novel, which almost is finished, and it will be a book and a sequel, and it will have to do with baseball. But it's a fictional story, too. Cool, cool. No, I love it. And I tell my students all the time to pursue things that are passions that you can do, because in today's connected world, you can do anything. Um, And I've shown it to them just in the school year. I thought, you know, wouldn't it be cool to interview teachers and talk to them around the country about why they teach? Now we've done 95 episodes and we do live events with the California Teacher Association. And I tell them like, you saw this banner on the wall. It's not behind me now because I'm not in my classroom. You saw this not exist and it was created. And um, I make jokes all the time, self-deprecating about my own music, but like it's led me to lots of live gigs, performances, meeting famous musicians and collaborating with them. And I have a new album coming out soon. And I just tell them like, even if it's just for me and then other people end up coming along, it's worth it. It feels good. It creates, it gives me that aspect of creativity. And then I can't talk a lot about it, but 
this love for radio and TV and play by play led me to a pretty good video game landing that's coming out later in the year. And I'm just like, that's amazing that that would come around again. So I always tell them to keep practicing and keep practicing. Um, Steve, I, this has been a great interview. I just have one more question and maybe a quick lightning round with you. All these years of broadcasting sports, is there one sports metaphor that you found to be very true of your life or of observing life? There are so many metaphors in so many serve to life. And that's what I think drew me to team sports. Because when individuals leave their ego in the locker room and play for each other, amazing things happen. I saw that with the 2002 Angels. I saw it with the 2014 and 15 Royals. And we're talking about young men from Venezuela, Dominican Republic, Florida, Texas, you, you know, but for three hours, they forgot about themselves. They came together as a unit. And I think that's why I was drawn to write The Walls of Luca the way I did, because it was individuals that were fractured. I'm, I'm very interested in faith lost, faith found. And that doesn't necessarily have to be faith in God. It can be, and uh, but it can be faith in the government. It can be faith in uh, um, political institution. It can be faith in leadership. It can be faith in a marriage that that, that fails. And that's what the principles are during World War One at the Walls of Lucca, but also what I see the same is true in sports. As an example, the 2014 and 2015 Royals finished last in home runs and last in walks in major in Major League Baseball. Of all 30 teams, they were last, and they went to back-to-back -back World Series and won one. The only way you can do that is together, and the same thing is true with family. If I put my wife first and she puts me first, how do we fail? And, 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 and we look at, at our relationship the same way. Uh, my mom was a school teacher, so she believes the answer to every problem in the world is education. And if you, if you have a disagreement uh, with, with, with someone or a culture or whatever it might be, educate yourself. I mean, we started wars over ignorance. Yeah. The ignorance of a, of a Muslim faith or of a Christian faith or a Jewish. We have created wars. But if we would educate ourselves to understand people, oh, my gosh, we, we, could, we could cure this planet. I love that. And I love the message that we can. We just need the, the willingness, the will to do so and to come together. All right, Steve, before we get out of here, some quick sports questions, because you're one of my idols in broadcasting. And I can't I got to just know some quick things. Uh, so you just fire off whatever you have in mind. And if you, you want to blow by one, just blow by one. But in your mind, of the people you've seen from watching as a fan and a broadcaster, most dominating closing pitcher? Oh, my. You know, we've, there have been so many good ones. Uh, Troy Percival, Wade Davis, uh, Greg Holland, obviously, with the, the Kansas City Royals. But just watching Mariano Rivera yeah. and the way he carried himself and the way he dominated, particularly in the big moments, he's the greatest closer I've ever seen. There you go. We knew what happened when Inner Sandman was playing. Yeah, that's for sure. Uh, most valuable starting pitcher, in your opinion? Well, my favorite pitcher of all time is Greg Maddox. Here's a guy who didn't overpower you like Roger Clemens or like Randy Johnson, but he was the most beautiful for me to watch because he was an artist. Mm -hmm. And um, I only did two of his games when I was working for ESPN, and they were two of the most beautiful games I could uh, broadcast because of the way he manipulated the baseball, the way he manipulated the hitters' minds. And so Greg Maddox is, is my favorite pitcher of all time. That's a great one. I always loved watching you call Jared Weaver for some sort of similar reason. Yeah. Didn't blow anybody away, but just skill. Uh, friendliest player? Oh, Rex Hudler. <laughs> you know, he just, he's just a treat to be around. And there have been so many. Torrey Hunter was fantastic oh, with the Angels. I loved him. And to this day, every time I see him, he comes over and gives a big hug. Um, you know, that's the one thing that uh, bothers me a little bit about our great game is too many times we in the media talk about the knuckleheads. Believe me, there are so many wonderful uh, people in baseball, athletes, and on our team in particular, from Ryan O'Hearn to Hunter Dozier to uh, Whit Merrifield to Nicky Lopez, um, Salvador Perez, it, it's, it's a good group. And when I was with the Angels, great guys to work with, David Eckstein and Adam Kennedy and Darren Erstad and Troy Percival and Garrett Anderson, just, just wonderful uh, gentlemen and, and great leaders and uh, men of services too, also. Yeah. 
uh, best food on the road? Best food on the road, I have to say Seattle, because I am a big fan of uh, Copper River salmon. And Rex Hudler and I usually go out there and we will um, devour salmon in uh, several different uh, restaurants around. But we love Seattle. All right. Let's say it's an off night for you and you got to pick three broadcasters to listen to. One for the first three innings, middle three innings, and the last three innings of the game. Who would you want to hear? Well, Vin Scully is my favorite of all time. He's just one of the greatest storytellers. So you could put him at any inning. And uh, Jack Buck was one of my favorites growing up uh, with the St. Louis Cardinals. And his son is a fantastic broadcaster. Now, Joe, um, Denny Matthews is a Hall of Fame broadcaster. I have a chance to work with with the Kansas City Royals. But um, I would have to put Vin at the very top. And I'll, and I'll give you a quick story. I was driving to do an Angels opening day game, and it was an opening evening contest. And the Dodgers were playing the Giants, and they were opening the new ballpark. And Vin's description of the new ballpark, the glove, the bay, the barges, the sailboats, the way the sun was flickering off of the waves, it was so compelling, Danny, that I literally drove off the road and had to jerk my car back on. And so Vin's number one. That's fantastic. That's a really good one. Uh, was there ever a player, maybe in your earlier days, that you found intimidating? Um, yeah, Kirk Gibson was intimidating. Uh, Reggie Jackson was a bit. But, you know, you you have a job to do. But just sometimes the way they treated others, you go, oh, man. But um, some of the best people helped me understand them. Uh, Sparky Anderson, I was a young broadcaster in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, Kirk Gibson was a rookie, and it was his first game in the major leagues. And I went up to him with my cameraman. I said, excuse me, Mr. Gibson, can we, we do a quick interview? And he goes, get out of here. <laughs> Sparky Anderson, the manager of the Tigers, saw that, and he asked me to come into his office and close the door, and he, and he said, I am so sorry about what took place. And I want you to know, I'm going to talk to that young man and I'm going to try and get him to improve the way he behaves with the media. And I apologize. Well, wouldn't you know it, years later, Sparky and I would work together with the Angels in 96, 97, 98. And what a fabulous human being. And um, he's one of my favorite people in sports. That's really great. Uh, Steve, this has been really wonderful. As we close out and talking to educators and talking to students, What's a piece of advice that you would want to share with them directly? Well, when I do a career day uh, talks at schools, I say there are four things that I do because I am an independent contractor. Number one, and you'd be surprised how many people don't do this, be on time. I'm always on time. I'm always early. If the, if the game starts at 7.15, I'm there by four o'clock at the latest, unless my producer says, can you be here at 3.30? So I'm always on time, even, even when I'm sick. I'm sorry, my dog ate my homework, no excuses. I'm there on time. Number two, be prepared. Every single game I, I've walked into, I prepare during the week for that game that night, whether it's football, basketball, or baseball, and baseball, obviously, I have to prepare every single day. Be enthusiastic and be easy to work with be a good teammate. And I think if you can do those four things, even if you get fired, and I've been fired before, you can look in the mirror and say, I did my four things. You know what? Because I did those four things, my reputation is good enough that I will get work elsewhere. And that's always been the case. Yes, I've been hired uh, at times when I've been surprised they hired me. And I've also been surprised when they fired me. But I've continued to work and, and it has been a wonderful life. That's so great, man. That is such a wonderful message. And we can't control everything around us, but we can definitely control ourselves. And those are wonderful ways to build up and continue to advance and never give up. Steve Fiziak, at Steve Fiziak on Twitter, stevefiziak.com. Thank you so for being so generous during this time and for giving us so many years of priceless memories and broadcasting. Thank you so much. Danny, thank you very much. And a big hello and thank you to your students.